Hi everyone, I hope you're having a good day so far. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today um, about blended learning. I'm going to go ahead and show my screen right now. If for some reason you can't see it, let us know in the chat box so that we can fix it and make sure that you are seeing the PowerPoint as we go along. Um, but basically what we're going to do today is we're going to start off talking about what blended learning is. Um, we're going to talk about some of the models and what they look like some be best practices to keep in mind when you're developing a blended le learning course and how Alex can be used um, in your blending learning course, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and click in to the next slide. So blended learning has a few different ways that it can be defined. Um, for the purposes of our presentation, we're gonna use the definition that you see here on the screen. Um, Essentially, what it's telling us is it's a course that is taught using some class instruction and some online learning. And it's important to keep in mind that a blending learning environment, um, that the students are learning part through the online delivery, and also they have some control over how they're learning. So the time that they're spending online, where they're accessing the content, whether it be at school, at home, so their place, the path that they're taking to get to this content, and at the pace that they are receiving the content. So the first slide that was really kind of getting into blended more learning is talking about kind of this model and what does it look like. Um, so we can see blended learning is made up um, of a brick and mortar instruction and online learning combined is what creates this blended learning. And there's really four different models that we can take on for this. The first one you can see is rotation model. The second one is flex model. The third is self blend model. And the fourth one is enriched virtual model. Now you can see off of the first one that there's a few little subcategories because there's different ways to do sort of this rotation. Um, station rotations we see very frequently, which is you're having different stations that the students rotate to. Um, a lab is very similar, but it's in a lab setting. The flipped classroom, which I'm sure you all have heard that buzzword, um, is where the students are getting the instruction at home on their own, and then when they come to class, they're furthering their learning. And lastly, it's individual, individual rotation model. So it's maybe a one-on-one -on -one rotation model with some students. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of jump into this and give you a little more information about each of these models. Um, so Flex, you can think of as an online platform that delivers most curriculum and where the teacher is providing support on an as-needed basis. Rotation is when students are rotating between learning stations, like I just mentioned. It's small group, collaborative, independent, online activities, um, all those things within a classroom. Self-blend, which is remote learning that supplements in-person brick-and-mortar courses. And um, the enriched virtual, which is using an online platform and the teacher to deliver all of the curricula. And the students in this model are working remotely because it is virtual. So blended learning does have some best practices. Um, you can see them on the screen. There's five best practices that we highly recommend. The first one is overall learning outcomes. The second is role of the student, providing support, online and face-to-face -face activities, and a grading scheme. So the first one, overall learning outcomes, it's so important with any course, um, but especially in blended learning courses, it's what do you want to see the student accomplish um, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, daily, however you want to set that up, you're setting these learning outcomes for the students, and you're telling them what does their success look like. The role of the student is you talking about the students, what you expect of them. You're preparing them for their responsibility of having to work online and what's um, going to be their goals. The support, providing support, it's important to put in these mechanisms because some students might need help in learning how to work independently and manage their time. Online and face-to-face is um, how do we want them to work online? How are we going to use that online information to complement um, what we're doing in classroom face-to-face? -face? And lastly, the grading scheme is how are you going to divide the course 
um, so that you're giving credit for online and face-to-face, -face, and what are the weight of those things. So let's go ahead and explore these in more depth. I'm going to ask Ray real quick if any questions have come in so that we can answer them really quickly before we get into some more information. Sure, Ashley. So these slides are looking great. So one person asked, um, are these slides going to be made available to us? at some point after the session? That's a great question, yes. So everyone who registered for the session will get a copy of this um, recorded webinar and the slides will be with it as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first one we're going to go into is overall learning outcomes. So they should be meaningful learning outcomes, and that means that they're specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and clearly stated. Um, there are many features in Alex that can help you define meaningful outcomes, one of them being some of our reports. The first one is the state standards report. So this is an individual student report that we're looking at here. Um, so we pulled this up for one student. All of our reports can be viewed at the individual or student level. So you can decide how you want to enter into getting that information. Um, what you're seeing in front of you is an Algebra 1 class correlated to the Common Core state standards. And then what you see is the standards, how many standards they've mastered out of how many they need to learn. And there you see topics mastered and topics not mastered. The one highlighted in yellow is a topic they haven't mastered, but they're ready to learn. So if you want to create meaningful goals for your students based on the standards, you can come into this report, find those ready to learn topics, and make that a goal for your student. This report is dynamic, so as the students learn topics and work through Alex, it's going to update. So you can come in here and update their learning outcomes and their goals as needed. Another report you can use is our progress bar report. Now, this report, again, is for a single student, but you do have the availability to look at this at a class level. If you look to the bottom of all those bars, you'll see it says initial assessment and then the blue is 14%. So that means that the student came into this course knowing 14% of this content. And if you go all the way up to the top bar, you see the blue is now 47%. So you're seeing their progress over time, how many assessments they're taking, and the date stamp for that. So you can create measurable goals and monitor their progress with this report. Where did they start off in the course? what goals are actually going to be achievable for them. Again, we want to say meaningful, achievable goals. I'm not going to set a goal that's unrealistic for the student based on the amount of knowledge they came into the course with. Um, so seeing that growth and learning as the student works is really, really great. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the role of the student. Um, this is the second best practice on our list, and it's basically letting the student know what their role is. Um, they need to know what their responsibilities are and what is going to be expected of them. Many instructors um, use the complimentary student account, the student view, to walk students through. Alex, for the first time, showing them you know, the answer editor tutorial, what an initial assessment looks like, and explaining its importance and its process. So that is something that I highly recommend. If you're not sure what your login name and password is to that, contact our customer support. We can email that to you. Or you can always use our Alex free trial, which is just on the home page. Um, but while you're talking about the initial assessment and what Alex is um, going to be presenting to the student, make sure you point out some key things. One, that they should try their best on their initial assessment. They want to do their best work so they're placed correctly. We don't want them to work, start working really below where they're at. We want them to start working where they're ready to learn. Okay, um, Let them know in an initial assessment they're not going to get any feedback. So it's not going to tell them if they're getting their questions correct or incorrect. It's kind of just moving them along. So they should be aware of that as well. They should always be using paper and pencil in Alex. So make sure that you tell them that and require that, especially during an assessment, because they need to work it out and just put in those final answers. 
And lastly, one of the things I recommend talking about is a, that button there that says, I haven't learned this yet. Sometimes it says, I don't know, depending on the course that you're in. Um, talk to your students about that button. What does it mean? When should they click on it? What does it do? And if you're not familiar with what it does, um, I'll give you just a little brief explanation. So that button is there that when the students get to a part of their initial assessment that they don't know how to do it yet. They just, they haven't learned that. They don't know the prerequisites. We don't want to frustrate them and have them work on stuff that they're not ready for. So when they click on that, the initial assessment readapts to them as a student um, so that we can change the next question on their assessment to place them accurately. So we want them to only click on that button when they really need to. One more thing about the initial assessment and just Alex in general is that the calculator is intelligent. We're not going to let students use the calculator unless it's appropriate for the question that they're working on and the student. So if you can, let students know to work on their problems and only use the calculator when it's available. Ray, any questions? Are we doing okay or did any questions come in? No, I think we're good for now. Okay, perfect. So a little bit more about the role of the student. So after they take that initial assessment, they're going to see their pie chart, which represents you know, how they did in the assessment and where they're starting at in the course material. Um, and many instructors find it helpful to introduce students to this pie chart and go over how to access the topics. You know, what do they do when they're in a topic? What does that look like? So I suggest going in and clicking on a pie slice, taking them into the topics and showing them how they work through and add it to their pie. Um, what do those numbers on the pie slice mean? So if my linear equation says 60 out of 72, what does that mean for me as a student? So that's a great thing to explain to them. In linear equations, you need to learn 72 different topics. Right now, you already know 60 of the 72, so you only need to add 12 more topics to your pie slice. Those are all things that the student should know and know how to access and go into the learning mode. Um, also set up some guidelines. What do they do if they don't know how to work or answer a question? Do they raise their hand or do you have them click on the explain page? Um, I suggest having them click on the explain page at least once and then trying another problem. And if they're still having problems, then asking for your help. Um, but you can decide that on your own. This is for you to decide and you need to let the students know so they know their role. Okay. Um, one of the other things you want to talk to the students about, and this is probably one of the most important things to talk about, um, according to me anyways, is that students are going to constantly get progress assessments. So that first initial assessment that they get is not going to be the only assessment they ever see in Alex. They're going to get constant progress assessments that are making sure that they're retaining what they're learning. Um, in progress assessments, just and in life in general, you know, we're not expecting students to retain everything that they learn. Most of the time, most people do not retain 100%. So let them know that it's normal during these progress assessments for them to lose a couple topics. They just need to work on them again a few more times and fully master it. Okay, so let them know that ahead of time so that they expect that and know that it's normal rather than getting faced with these assessments and possibly losing topics and being frustrated. So next, let's talk about providing support. Um, so th this is the third best practice, and it's always a good idea to put these mechanisms in place um, to help students who are not used to working independently. Um, they're not used to managing their own time, and they might be unfamiliar with course technology or just online learning in general because it might be their first time. So it's a good way to set up things for the students. Um, and many instructors using a blended learning environment put emphasis on, or emphasis, I'm sorry, on time on task. Um, show students how they can access their individual reports to make sure that they're attempting as many topics as you're requiring, that they're spending as, many, as much time as they need to, um, so they can monitor their own progress and product, productivity. Um, and if you want to 
kind of guide the students to where that is, when they log into their student account in the top right hand side, there's a link that says reports. If they click on it, there's a tab that says time and topic. Um, by default, it's a week view and they can change the date range they want to view. But you can see here that in the columns it has a date stamp so you know what date um, the time was logged on, the amount of time they spent working that day, the number of topics they attempted, and the number of topics they mastered. Okay, so with knowing they can access this information, many instructors find it helpful to create daily and weekly goals for the students so that they can go in there, monitor, and check them out. And creating these mini goals helps the students who are not used to working independently. Another way of providing support is motivating your students. Um, these are a couple examples of boards and classrooms from um, teachers that have emailed us, you know, how they're motivating their students. So we put these pictures in there. There's so many different ways to support your students. Um, the first thing I have to say that with anything is the students need your buy-in. You need to be supportive. You need to make progress a big deal. You need to reward them for that progress. And how you de decide to do that is up to you. Um, but verbal recognition, board recognition, um, something like that, a prize, whatever you want to do, that's great support for the students. And um, you know, while the blended learning environment experience may be new for you, keep in mind it is new for your students as well. To motivate and encourage them is to create this, you know, and foster the supportive environment that is rewarding them. So one of the um, diagrams where it says my pie progress and you see the color round circles, what this teacher is doing is every time the student masters a pie slice, so they've gotten all of the topics finished in that pie slice, the student gets to write their name on that pie slice. So if you look at it, you can see the green pie slices are pretty full, but next to those where there's a red and a yellow, there's only a few students. So this is a great way for them to come in and kind of see how they're moving along with their peers and be excited about the progress that they're making. Um, the one in the top right hand corner are thermometers. So it's percentage from, I think it starts at 10% and goes up to 100. And every 5% increments that the students achieve, they get a color in their thermometer. So they can see it rising and, you know, that's an activity that they get to do and, are ex and is excited about. You can think of a bunch of other ways, I'm sure, to support your students, but again, it's really important that you give that buy-in and that you make them excited about it by your excitement as well. So with providing support, it's also important to consider how the students are going to receive support from how they're going to learn how to use the technology, if they have a problem, who do they go to, um, who's their contact person, should they always email you if they have questions, what if the question is something with um, they're at home computer. Should they email you or you want to give them um, Alex customer supports information? So those are things that you should set up ahead of time so they know who they're supposed to contact when they have questions. Um, for them contacting you, we have an internal database. Um, it's a messaging system and you can see here there's a graph. There's an actual math palette in our internal messaging system so that makes it very easy for the students to ask those mathematical type of questions and they can send it directly to you. There's also an option that while they're in a problem or an explain page, if they go to the Alex inbox, they can attach that page. There's a little checkbox. So they can basically give you a screenshot of exactly what they were looking at and what they have a question on. Okay. Um, the Alex support page has frequently asked questions. It also has a link to email Alex customer support. And it also gives a link to contact us directly via phone. Um, so those are all things that you would want to provide to the students as well. And these are just good to define ahead of time. Um, just to make sure, again, that the students know who they're supposed to contact when they have any questions or concerns. Hey, Ashley, I have a question here for you. Yes. 
Um, so uh, with those slides that showed, uh, I guess, student progress and on the boards there with the thermometers, those, those are really neat. Yes. Um, is there anything uh, that inside of the Alex system that are like any fun activities that are like that that we can share with the, the audience here? Oh, okay. Um, so that's a great question. So as far as things inside of Alex, one of the, the things we commonly hear teachers use as motivation and um, fun for the students is quick tables. So if you haven't used quick tables before, I would suggest, you know, going on our website looking at quick tables. It comes free with all of our courses. Um, it's basically math fact mastery. So they get to learn their math facts for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But it's also fun because there's games. It's limited to how much time they can spend because we still want them to work on the pie and learn the content, right? And we need to be rotating and doing all these other things for our blended learning. But it's a great break and reward for the students. So um, you can do, again, those quick tables or you know, you can figure out your own way to create some sort of incentive inside the program. So meaning that you can have them achieve something, and if they achieve that, they get X reward, right? So that would be something you would have to create yourself. Are there any other questions, Ray? Yeah, there's another question. So okay. uh, when you were talking about the role of student, you were addressing uh, assessments and uh -huh. uh, talking about the initial assessment. Um, so one of the questions that came in is, uh, what is the difference between a progress assessment and a comprehensive assessment or initial assessment? Okay, so um, let's start from the initial assessment. So the initial assessment is placing the student in the course material. So the goal of that initial assessment is to adapt to the students um, based on how they're answering their questions to find out how much of the course material does this student know what do they not know? And most importantly, what are they ready to learn? So we can start them working right at that point. The progress assessments are triggered as the student works. So as the student roughly learns about 20 topics, we trigger that progress assessment to make sure there's retention. So if for some reason they don't retain something they learned, that's when it gets added back into their pie, which I talked about is, is very normal. Um, a comprehensive assessment is only going to happen if you schedule it yourself, and it behaves more like the initial assessment. It's testing the students across the course material. It's not testing them on their progress and retention, and it's not necessarily placing them. So most of the time, we only see comprehensive assessments as like an end of course assessment, meaning you know, the students are in the last week of school and ending Alex, and I just want to see their comprehensive score compared to their initial assessment score type of thing. It's not something we see them do all throughout the year. Ray, is there anything you want to add into that? No, that was great. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? No, we're good. Okay, great. So the next thing we're going to talk about is online and face-to-face -face activity. So that means we need to take what we're doing online and somehow also incorporate it in our face-to-face -face activity, right? Um, when designing a blended learning course, it's important to consider which components of the course will be delivered online and which ones will be face-to-face. -face. It's also important to decide how the online and face-to-face -face activities will complement each other. We want to make sure it's smooth and not disjointed right? You don't want it to be confusing for the students, okay? Um, and you can use this report that we're looking at right now to help you with that. This report's going to give you data that you can use in your classroom, and you also know what the students have been doing online. So it combines kind of the information of both. Um, so what you see here is the table of Alex Cable of Contents. Um, underneath is each pie slice the percentage of each pie slice that has been mastered. When you click on that percentage, it expands out, and it'll show you every topic in the pie slice and three columns next to them, the percentage of students who have mastered that topic, who have not mastered that topic, and who are ready to learn that topic. So it helps you identify all of the already mastered topics. So if you were going to cover you know, let's just say identifying solutions to a system of linear equations as a 
group lecture for your entire class and you saw that percentage was really high, that might not be something you need to do at a class level. You might want to pull those students who haven't learned it into a small group um, and find something that more students are ready to learn. Um, you can look at the ready to learn column to create those groups. So if you are using rotation models or one-on-one, -on -one, um, or even if the students are working independently, you can guide them to specific topics and pie slices based on knowing what they're ready to learn. Um, since you know the students who have mastered it and the students who are ready to learn it, you could also do some peer-to-peer -peer learning. So I can get these mastered students and pair them with the students who are ready to learn it and let them collaborate together. Um, you can also use it as a project um, or group project based thing where you choose a topic and assign some sort of project that relates to it because you know all the students are, have the prerequisite knowledge and are ready to learn that topic. Um, one of the great things that I really love about this report is all of the topic types. Um, when you click on the name, it's going to give you a sample problem. So if you were going to cover a specific topic at a group level or small group level, you can click on it. It'll give you that sample problem that you can project onto the board. So you don't need to use a textbook or create instances on your own, you can use Alex for that. And they're unique instances every single time you click on them. So the next portion for online and face-to-face -face activities um, is how the students are going to learn online with Alex. So they um, are going to go ahead and complete the portion of learning through their pie chart. So students are working on topics as they are ready to learn them. And if for some reason they need support when they're inside of a topic, there's an explain page there that they can click on. Now, the explain page is going to give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to answer that exact problem. So it's very specific for the students. Um, every time that they get a new problem and work through it if they need to click on the explain page again it's going to change to be specific to what they're working on so the students can learn in Alex that way also Alex is going to now provide feedback for the student as they're learning so you can see our sample up here says your answer can be simplified so they were asked to simplify the answer but they didn't simplify it enough so we're giving them meaningful feedback that's very specific to what they input in Alex so that they're learning as they're going. Um, as students are adding these topics to their pie, their pie is going to update and new topics are going to become available for them. So that's what they're going to be doing through their pie chart. One of the last things we're going to talk about is the grading in Alex. And it's so important in a blended course and all courses um, that you create a grading screen or I'm sorry, a grading scheme and provide students with feedback on how they are performing. Um, so in a blended course, it's especially important to decide how you're going to divide the course grading scheme for online and face-to-face -face components. And you also want to decide what assessment methods will be used to assess student work for the online and face-to-face -face components. So these are things that you should think about before you get started. And also, it's, again, conveying that information to the students so they know what is expected of them. Um, for grading the Alex portion of the blended course, many instructors find it most effective to set weekly goals based on time and progress. So the way they do that is they give the students an amount of time that they should be working in Alex, say three hours per week, and they give the students an amount of topics that they need to um, achieve each week, and they figure out a grading skill from there. I have some examples that we're going to get into in a second, um, so I'll go ahead and, and wait on getting too much information on that, but that's how we see most teachers use it. Um, and you can use the time and topic report at a class level to monitor the student progress and assign a grade. You can also use our custom reporting feature, which is new. Um, so if you guys are unaware of what that is, Ray's actually going to be doing a couple sessions on it this week, so you can register for that. 
um, or you can check out the documentation online. But basically what it does is it lets you customize a report that automatically can send information to you so you don't have to go in and, gen and um, generate it all the time. So let's jump into um, a couple other grading things before I show you those examples. Um, some other ways to assign grades in Alex besides just looking at the time and topic report is to assign a grade for percent mastery retained between assessments. So we have a screenshot of that here. I'm going to get into that in more detail in a previous slide, but basically you're looking at um, two assessments at a time. Another way is to use the Alex worksheet. Um, the Alex worksheet is individualized for each student. It's 16 questions based on things they've recently worked on. So it's basically like an individualized paper and pencil exam, and it's offline. It's printable, so the students are working on it you know, at home, um, in a rotation center where they don't have access to the internet. Um, again, you can use it as a quiz. Um, another option is actually using the quiz feature in Alex, which is an online quiz, and you're choosing the specific set of topics the students are quizzed on. Every student gets their own unique version of the quiz, and it's automatically graded and recorded in Alex for you to go in and look at. Ray, any questions before I get into the nitty-gritty of grading? Uh, there is a question about um, grading methods, but I think you might be covering some of them. So let's, let's go ahead and have you talk about them first. Okay, perfect. So let's go back to the first one I said, which is time and progress. So um, hours per week. So this teacher has clearly defined her goal. So we see goal is three hours per week. We're looking at an individual student, and we can see the total amount of time that he spent that week is one hour and 41 minutes, which is equivalent to 101 minutes. Um, three out, and there's three hours that we want the student to spend. So when we look at this, we're doing 101 minutes divided by 180 minutes, which is 0.561. So if we're doing this out of a 10-point scale, Herbert would receive 5.6 points out of 10. So it makes it pretty easy to look at it this way. You do have to convert the total time into minutes, um, which is relatively easy to do. So you can um, do that. But the goal of three hours per week is um, a reasonable amount of time for the student to be working in Alex. We recommend two to three hours per week for optimal learning. So you can keep that in mind when you're thinking about how you're going to blend it into your classroom. Obviously, you can do it less or higher um, as far as time is concerned, but we see the best results with using Alex two to three hours a week. So that's how we get to, a, say, grade with a time, so points. Progress is the same thing. So I'm setting a goal for my students of how many topics they should master per week, and here it's nine. Um, this is, again, a good goal to set for the student because on average students are probably going to learn about two to three topics per hour. It might scale up and down a little bit depending on where they're in, in the course, but on average they're at least able to do usually two to three topics per hour. Okay, so we think of three hours a week, and we're expecting two to three topics per hour. That's how we got to those nine topics. So you look here at the total number of topics the student attempted, which is eight, and the goal was nine. So if we divide those, we get 0.889, which is 8.9 points out of 10. I would probably round it up and just give them nine points out of 10. That's up to you guys, though. I'm a nice, I'm nice, so I round up. Um, but you can see here that this time and topic report will give you two key things you can use for grading, and all you have to do is pull up this one report. For each student, it gives you the total amount of time and the total topics. The next one we mentioned was the progress between assessments. So remember I said you're going to compare two assessments at a time? So it's always the most recent assessment compared to the one that happened before that. Um, and if we want to give a grade based on assessment 
progress, remember that assessments are triggered as students spend time in Alex and as they learn topics. So progress assessments are a positive thing. They're working and they're learning, so they should be excited that they're triggering these assessments, and you should be as well. Um, so for grading that retention between assessment, it ensures the students are actually spending time working and making progress. Okay. Um, in this example we have here, you can see that the not the top bar, but the one right under it, so that was the previous assessment, was 48%, and the student worked and added 9%, so she was at 57%. Her most recent assessment, which is right above that, was 55%. So that means she lost 2% between assessments. So if you divide it 55 by 57, you get 9.7 points out of 10. Now this is saying that 100% retention is considered full credit. Um, it will be up to you if you want to do that or not. A lot of teachers have changed that scale a little bit and said if the student gets at least 90 or, you know, yeah, I guess 95% or higher of the topics retained, I will give them the full 10 points because it's normal to lose topics. I don't want them to be discouraged by the progress that they're making because they're doing a great job. So I'm going to lower that a little bit so that the students know if they lose some topics, it's okay, and they're still going to get full credit for that anyways. So actually, I think this is a good place to ask this question. Yeah. Um, do you recommend grading by the percent of topics mastered uh, overall on the course? So like, as we're looking at this progress bar, do you make, recommend making a grade based on this? Just in general, so looking at it and seeing 55% and just creating a grade, is that what they mean? Yeah, like using these progress bars. Uh, it looks like that seems to be the per percent of topics mastered overall. Um, do you recommend using this as a grade in, in, some, in some way? That was the question. Um, I think if you do it like we've shown and you're giving it um, a grade based on each student's individual retention, um, it's a great way to grade. If you're setting like a rubric and you're expecting them to reach a certain percentage, um, that could be kind of difficult because the students are going to enter all over the place. They're in at their own level. They're going to move through the course at a different pace. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend setting um, kind of a generalized goal like that. I would make it more individualized and based on their retention. Um, I personally recommend the time on topic and the number of um, topics added as my, you know, one that I highly recommend. And that's because if you're setting a time for the students to work in Alex and you're setting topics that they need to achieve, one cannot get without the other. So you, they need to spend the time to learn the topics. Well, maybe the student was really quick, and in an hour and a half, they got all nine topics. Well, they can either take, you know, the few points they're going to get for that hour and a half and the full credit for those nine topics, or they're going to keep working and add that time and increase their topic count because they want full credit for the time as well. So it sort of balances it out. Do you have anything to add to that, Ray? No, I think that's great. Thanks. Okay, you guys have some great questions. Um, so let's go ahead and move into Alex in your classroom. So um, these are some examples of easy ways to incorporate Alex into your traditional classroom. Um, at the elementary school level, we already see rotation models implemented. Um, it's something that most elementary school teachers are familiar with. They already use it, so it's really easy to add in Alex to that rotation since you already have that system built up. Um, so that's you know, one of the things we recommend doing with Alex at an elementary school is to add us into one of those stations. Um, at a middle or high school, you don't see as many rotation models. You see more of like a self-blend model. Um, so students are using Alex also outside of the class to supplement what is done in the institution. They have a math lab. Um, they have an after-school lab they can go to. It's assigned as homework. Um, so it's there to support them um, more in a self-blended way. So um, actually, we have a question, actually, about yes. uh, the rotation model. So it looks like uh, one of our uh, teachers here is thinking about using this 
Um, so what does this look like? I mean, what are the rotations, the time, how frequent? What does that rotation model look like? Okay, um, that can vary depending on how you want to implement Alex. Um, what we see a lot of time is, you know, group work. So you'll have three groups. One's working on a topic or a group project based on what you've pulled from that Alex Pi report. Another group could be working on an Alex worksheet that's individualized for them or working with you and you're teaching them a topic, could be both. And then the other group is online actually working in their pie chart and they rotate in circles. Um, depending on how much time and how many days per week you're gonna dedicate to Alex, it's gonna differentiate how much time you should spend in each group and how many times per week you should do it. Um, but one of the things we usually like to say is, you know, try at least do Alex three times a week for, you know, 45 minutes. And then if you have 45 minutes, then that means, you know, you have them about a little over 15 minutes um, per, or 15 minutes per group. So you're cycling them around per group. Um, but you can do it a different way. So if you could do it three times a week for an hour each session and break that up. Did that okay, answer uh, their question? Uh, I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Uh, if uh, I think there's uh, what, actually there is one more question about um, extra support. So okay, uh, it looks like um, so when a student's working at home, what are some things they can do to add extra support working from home? I guess I'm a little confused. They want support from their teacher or they want support from Alex? Does it say? I guess both. I mean, is okay. there any way to? I guess you know with a blended learning model, students are working from home. So yeah. Uh, so as we talked about before, one of the great things about Alex is the internal messaging system. So they can message their teacher. They have the mathematical palette so they can write those questions and send that over. Um, there's also the explain page so they can read through it. And if they are working at home, the parent can hopefully um, step in and read the explain page and maybe help them through that as well. Another thing teachers can do is they can make resources available for their students. Um, there is a resource section in Alex where they can upload documents, link out to websites, um, create short little videos, things like that, that are put into the pie slices and the topics, and the students can access them for additional support. Um, that's something you have to do. Um, it's not automatically created by Alex, but it's a really great resource to use to support your students. Can you think awesome. of anything else, and Ray? No, that's, that's great. Um, and just to put a little plug in here, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of these resources, and especially topic level resources at my next session, uh, at our next session, which is tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. So if you haven't signed up for that one, we will be talking about those resources that Ashley just mentioned. Uh, there. So uh, we don't have any other questions here on the list. If anybody has any more, please send them in. Um, Ashley, do you have anything else to add here? Yeah, I just have a couple slides I'm going to add. Um, one is the an Alex resources slide, so you guys will get this when we send out the PowerPoint and the, the recording. Um, but it links to customer support. It links to the training center, which has different documents on features and videos on the features. There's an overview of an Alex video you can watch, um, and there's some implementations that you can read. So what we've done is we've sent out some emails to our users and said, hey, will you voluntarily tell us how you're using Alex? You know, some of our other teachers would really like to read this. So it's, it's a small sample of our you know, population right now, but they're awesome. You can go in and see how do other schools grade with Alex. How much time are they spending? How do they use it in their blended learning environment? Um, so I recommend using these resources and taking a look at them. And then we also are putting in some blended learning resources. So there are things that you can read and do research on to find out more information about creating a blended learning environment, um, what does it mean, and what resources are available for me if I am using this blended learning environment. 
Well, I hope you all enjoyed your session. I enjoyed talking to all of you and listening to your wonderful questions. I hope that you guys join us for the rest of our sessions this week. And if you have any further questions, we're going to stay on the line for a few minutes and answer those. Um, please send them in to Ray. And uh, if you're leaving, have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We, uh, we do have a couple more questions, actually, that oh, just came in. Or perfect. maybe I just didn't see them. So if you need to run, go ahead and go. Um, we just have a couple more questions that we'll answer. Uh, one person wants us to talk about integrating Alex with a textbook material and how that, how that works. Uh, okay. With this. Yes, so you can integrate Alex with a textbook. It's through your class admin customize this class settings. Basically what you do is you select your textbook from the drop down list and you're able to set due dates for the chapters um, or sections, units, however your textbook is broken up. Basically what Alex does when you select that is we reorganize our content to go along with your textbook. So students aren't necessarily working on all their ready-to-learn topics as they're ready to learn them. They're working on ready-to-learn topics in the chapters and units or sections that you've assigned to them in the order in which you've assigned them. Um, you have the ability to create the same due dates for all of them. You can skip chapters. You could just make it one chapter. Um, it depends how you want to use it. You have that flexibility. And then also what happens is in their explain page, a resource is added in the right corner that tells them where to go in their textbook to get more information. So if I was struggling on multiplying fractions with different denominators, it might tell me to go see chapter three, section 3.2 for more information. So hopefully that answered their question about uh, the textbook. If you have further questions about our textbook integration, um, please respond back into the chat and let us know. Um, okay. Yeah, it looks like um, I think that's the final question there, Ashley. Uh, okay. A couple sort of housekeeping things here. If you ever want to contact us, you can um, contact us at implementation at alex.com. That is our, our group email address. So we're very happy to answer these questions if you have any uh, things going forward, please uh, send those over to us. Uh, you also will be getting an email with uh, some resources, uh, like Ashley said, and also I believe a survey will be sent out about this session. So if you have any comments, uh, we're always trying to improve, so please uh, do that for us if you will. Other than that, thank you so much for joining. On behalf of Ashley, we really ap appreciate you joining today. Thank you. <laughs>